So um, I was just going to give a brief introduction. Um, we're switching around the, uh, the order of the presentations just a little. Um, Hans Chester Nakhilan will be going first, and he's kind of giving a little bit of the historic background of spruce root basketry of the Lingat. So Nakhilan. ethnographers Kunach Stuka had the tea, you who ye had the tea, I gee ya. A king in a chishach to us, go ye ya hokai ya. Organizers Kunach Kunach di at ya, wush who to a di ya. Sharing our knowledge conference. She had the hain, she had the hain. Ach. Hunk Ian, she had the Hena Hilk Uhas, her Achta Chunk Ian, so Gnestish Hati Adi Ahish Kuas, now we Jan Nach City Ahishi Nanach, now we Jan Yadi Ayahat Achilk Achilk Art Achilk Clark Kua Jinek Ahe Ahish Tut Ua at where Shangu Kedi, Achia Shangu Kedi Yadi Tsuhat City, Tsuach Kla Ish Dach Ku De Nu Du Sagen, Hit Hit Dach, Hunahu Kwan Hu City, Achlik Achia Shangu Kedi Dach Han Ayahat, Yuha Nakahidi Chak Chagu Ayi. Gus ech who sit Gus ech ye wuti Hanaka hedi shukwa Dagina hit Daha saik who as hechi hit you do sak Ayahat uu city luk Hecht kayech city Ha hechi who as Gate yach yeti Wutik a away would eek at Shawe, Gate Yachiti hard, oo. Helt Ushugus, Helt Ushugu Uti, you kick saddi aye. Chakuna ah away, ha hechi. Chade had no kelk kahit, ach tu wa sigu ye, ach tu kelk kahit, ach tu wa usgu ye sine ye. Kunahaya ha shagun aya achia to asgu in Kahwanigi, Chiegu gank aya ha shagun hasset, Luknahadi hasseti, Gunil Chishawa. Um, I'm going to just go right into my presentation. If you would like to know more about my lineage and what I've talked about, please speak with me later. Several years ago, about four years ago, I was invited to go up to the uh, little AAA is what we call it, the Alaska Anthropological Association. And Professor Monteith was one of my instructors and he asked if I would be interested in going to Fairbanks to present this term paper that I did on spruce root harvest and production uh, among the Tlingit people. And so, what I did was I, I began looking at the ethnography that was documented uh, when Emmons came among our people. And I looked a lot at his work, and from there I branched into other works um, by the Dauenhauers and by, uh, by um, Aldona Genitis and and I used a lot of different facets of the, the ethnography. I didn't just focus on 
the spruce root weaving. I looked at the trade and the economy and the way that our people lived back in those times to get a better, better sense of why uh, spruce root harvest and production was a vital component to our culture and also why it um, went through an enormous change with the influx of your American cultures. Um, so that's my scope, that's my view of this term paper. I'm coming from a Western point of view and uh, I'm trying to use the research methods that I've been taught while uh, obtaining my bachelor's degree in social sciences. Um, I later went back and got a master's degree in teaching and am now teaching at Glacier Valley School where I went kindergarten through fifth grade and I'm teaching first and second graders and um, one of the areas I would like to implement into the curriculum is weaving but um, being a pretty new teacher it's too much of a bite for me to chew right now so I'll stick with management and learning that whole ball of wax first <laughs> um, so um, one of the other areas before I go on I would like to talk about uh, working with some of the the classrooms in our district there in Juneau and with the teachers of the Harborview program and not just the teachers but the administrators and the people behind the scenes who help that program function and serve our native students. Um, I got the opportunity last November to travel to Washington DC because we're all working on what's called an electronic field trip and in May there is going to be a live broadcast and this is put on through Ball State University in Indiana, Indiana and uh, the National Museum of American Indian in Indians in Washington DC through the Smithsonian and the reason I'm talking about this is because while I was there we got to go to their vault, we got to go to their collections out in Virginia to look at their artifacts that are not on display. And I was just shocked at the hundreds of baskets that are sitting there in the museum, not in the museum, in their collection that is not available to just the general public to view. And I was shocked to see so many baskets literally hundreds upon hundreds of baskets and not just baskets the little cups that the Icht would use to help purify himself um, and ceremonial hats that the Hitzati wear and the list just went on and on and on so uh, I got even more excited because uh, how to get kids how to get young kids interested into this and how to teach the weaving to them and not just the weaving but the history of it and what happened to the to that art form well it's an art form now but um, I'm jumping ahead of myself so maybe I'll just get into my discussion <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it was an honor to go back and work with them and I'm extremely thankful to have the opportunity to work with such fine scholars in the Juno School District and with my elders and my own teachers. Um, my, well, okay. Um, spruce root harvest and production was mainly a task that the women performed. And I've heard a couple of comments during presentations about gender roles and how the men did this and the women did that. and. Um, going into the ethnography that's kind of what they document too but I know from my own experience growing up that that that's not the case um, that everyone played an important role within our livelihood and that's the way it was and so when when we get up and speak and when leaders get up and speak it it irritates me to hear them say things like well, a long time ago, we never let the women speak, and, um, but we'll go ahead and let her speak tonight to close off our ceremony. These kinds of things have got to stop because there is not a lot of time left 
And if you know about Shingit culture and you know yourself as a Shingit, you come through your mother's line. So to hear someone, to hear people saying things like that is detrimental to our culture and it really puts down half of who we are because we come from a matrilineal line and the women in Tingit culture have just as much to offer and just as much to say as the males did and do. So with that said, the women had numerous responsibilities <laughs> within their lineage. And one of the most pertinent utilitarian disciplines that was passed down for generations was that of spruce root harvest and production. The females produced many styles of spruce root weavings, including baskets, mats, hats, cups, and the production of such items has a direct effect on the economy, the livelihood, the foods, and the educational facets of Tlingit culture. The displacement of customary practices and utilization by the integration of newer material culture items almost caused the extinction of, of spruce root production and harvest among the modern Tlingit. Baskets and weavings from long ago do not serve the same function in today's world, especially in regards to gathering food and things for survival. However, this remains in the economy of the Tlingit as weavers now sell their art to collectors, museums, or make them as gifts, or give them at Kuik, or give them to donations. Um, this is a map that I took from Junaitis' book, and it just shows the entire, well, not the entire, but a majority of the Northwest Coast and the different groups of people who inhabit this area. Um, and the reason I, I did this was when I was looking at the work that the ethnographers did, I noticed that um, they talked a lot about trade and iron and different metals being brought into Tlingitani and how how did my question was how did that connect to spruce root harvest and production so um, I looked at I looked at that facet of uh, spruce root harvesting and production and I'll talk about that a little later but that's one of the reasons why I put this slide up there um, was to show the numerous groups that the Tlingit would interact with. Um, the Tlingit were well known for trading all along the coast and up into the interior. Um, one of the other articles I looked at was given to me by uh, one of my weaving teachers, Dolores Churchill, and it was by a person named A.S. Harris, and this was a study that was done on the environment of the spruce root, or the spruce trees. And Young said, or I'm sorry. Young spruce trees provide adequate roots. Lateral surface roots grow in excellent conditions with unif within uniform sandy soil. Um, and after spending time in weaving classes with both Dolores and with Janice Criswell, um, just hearing the different ideas that they have as um, gatherers and weavers, uh, that it sandy conditions might not necessarily be the ideal spot for roots, but that's what was documented a long time ago, and so that's the word that gets out there, but individual weavers might have their own preferences, and I'm not gonna say any more because I'll give their secrets away. <laughs> um, the area from Icy Straits out to the coast and up north to the Prince William Sound has the type of landscape that where spruce trees are ideal um, it's their ideal environment and it provides um, numerous opportunities for us to go out and gather the roots because of the landscape. Um, and this is due to the recent geological changes which prompt the new growth of forests uh, which contain little to no cedar which will quickly outgrow the areas and take over, um, t just take over. Uh, some 
most of the time when I go digging, it's in within mossy layers. And uh, the other thing that Harris stated was that this mossy layer with some sand allows the root, the lateral roots to shoot out really far um, with little side branching. And uh, I, I believe it was, uh, was it Mary Lou who got the longest root? She, her husband, they were out in the Queen Charlotte Islands and they pulled up a root that was 72 feet long. So I think maybe uh, getting first and second graders out there, they might try and beat that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the other thing that I looked at about with Harris's article is that Harris thinks that a lot of these ecological factors made spruce root harvest and production an outcome of the Shingit's environment. Uh, and I think that's a really important thing for us to keep in mind as we examine um, this area of Shingit culture. Um, I'm now going to read a little bit of the history of, that the Shingits have about weaving, how basketry was brought to Shingit culture. And I took this from Francis Paul's book called um, Spruce Root Basketry of the Alaska Clinket. Francis Paul re recounts the legend of the origin of basketry. Raven had already taken the sun, moon, and stars, made the tides, brought life to streams with salmon and trout when the origin of basketry came to the Shingit. A young woman living in the cloud village married the son who had turned himself into a man. They had eight tr children together over the course of time when son lived with his wife and children in the cloud village. Then one day the woman began to feel anxious for her children and their future. She began to weave a basket from some roots she picked. After completion, her husband, the son, took the basket and increased its size until it was large enough for all of them to fit. Then he put the basket from the Cloud Village onto the Alsec River, which leads into Dry Bay, just south of present-day Yakutat. And that is the reason that the first baskets in southeastern Alaska were made by the Yakutat women. Emmons describes the story in a similar fashion, but goes on to say, this was the first basket, and from it, was learned the art of weaving. From this point on, the Shingit developed an important and necessary commodity that supported their livelihood. This portion of their mythology demonstrates the unique relationship that women have with this art and may also be the reason why this was only considered women's work in the ethnography. <clears throat> and I say consider, it might be considered just women's work because it's not. I know, uh, I remember my mom telling about how Grandma Jenny and uh, Grandpa Frank Dick, they would go out digging spruce roots and um, he would be down on the ground digging just as much as she would and he helped with the fire and um, getting the outer bark off and I think when it came time to do the weaving is when he stepped aside because um, it's, it's tricky work. So the next slide that I have coming up is, uh, it shows the, a couple of different tools. On the right you can see what we call ina, and um, the picture doesn't look complete uh, because ina, the one I have is probably about this tall and it's not, the opening, oh dear, the opening isn't as wide, um, but you can pull the two ends together to help get the tension so you can pull the, so you can strip the bark off of the root. But um, I've been out harvesting before and forgot to put the ina in the car. So what did we do? We went and looked for a piece of driftwood and used a piece of driftwood that had that same V-type shape and just used that to pull the bark off. It didn't work quite as good, but uh, we were still able to get the bark off. So um, an, ina, an ina might will suffice, and that's the, the proper tool to use. But if you're in a pinch, you can always think of something, look for something else in the environment to help. Um, on the left side, there's a digging stick and uh, sometimes they would find a, a uh, like a willow tree or an alder tree and they would take a branch off of it and it has a nice little hook on the side. So you guys can uh, get a better view of the, the, 
the digging stick has a just a little like a beak on a bird and that's what they would use to jab into the ground to take away the the moss or the dirt um, some of the other I didn't just look at ethnog ethnographic work I interviewed a few elders about their experiences with weaving and one of the people I talked to was Anita Lafferty and uh, her mother was a well-known basket weaver and her name was Ida Kadishan and when I spoke with her she told me that her mother would go out with her family they would all go out they would make a, a family outing of it and they would always have a picnic and it wasn't just to go get roots that's one of the other things that I learned is that you just don't go get roots and then go take care of them. You're out there, you're interacting with the environment, uh, you're interacting with the people who go with you, your family members or your friends, and um, there's a deep connection that we have with our land. And yesterday, sitting uh, in with the place-based education seminars, I kept coming, my mind kept thinking about this and how this is how we learn to do things was going out into our environment and utilizing the things that we had and watching the different patterns that we saw in nature and thinking how could we make something work with this and um, so getting tapping into Hingit Tundatani um, it, it goes into everything that we do but anyway uh, Anita said that my mother would just walk around with her hands out like this with her palms facing the ground and she would just talk to the trees then she would go and pick her spot and it would be away from the tree not right next to it and um, the one thing that I I really treasure with this comment is that um, that that part has gone from our culture that um, singing that respect towards the environment um, maybe the talking to the trees is almost gone talking to the spirits of Asquani Asquani and um, thanking them for allowing you to take a little bit of who they are because they are living just like we are and uh, that is a, a precious statement from Anita, and I, I thank her for that. Um, the next slide that I had up was um, just a picture of some spruce roots that were recently dug that um, are waiting to be roasted and stripped. But I'll go ahead and talk about it anyway. I also looked at some of the work that Lewis Shotridge did, and uh, I believe that was in Francis Paul's book. But he said that it was instinct which led the basket maker to search the forests and dig for roots. And um, after working with Dolores and going out with her, we always, uh, when she comes to town, sometimes we meet up and take her out the, to one of our spots. And um, it takes numerous trips to get enough materials to make one item, especially if you're working on a hat. It can take it takes just as much time to go and get the materials as it does to prepare them and weave and then to weave them into the project that you're doing um, and so after going through this process myself I, I I'm humbled by it and I'm humbled by the knowledge that these ladies had and handed down for generations um, <clears throat> I think I might just skip ahead and then when it, when the PowerPoint comes back up, I have a cross section of a Sitka spruce root I'd like to show all of you. Um, but there was a, a big shift. Oh. Okay, right there. Thank you. So uh, these are spruce roots that were recently dug waiting to be roasted and stripped and there are different ways that weavers will um, either bundle or bind their roots uh, a lot of us put them into figure eights and I believe the Haida put them into circles and do it like that um, I don't really have my own way I just 
however it gets bound, it gets bound and stored. So, <laughs> but I, I re recall Dolores saying that the, the Shingits have a certain way and the Haida have a certain way of, or they used to, of um, storing their roots. Uh, here's a here's a cross section of a Sitka spruce root. Um, the inner pith is this area right here, and early in the spring, the inner pith isn't as um, developed, I guess, or it isn't as red. It has this rusty red brown innard, and um, a lot of times that just gets taken away. We didn't we don't weave with that part. Um, that's not usually woven into baskets or hats or anything. So that's the inner pith and then we have the the bark, this outer bark right here where you can see the side and feeder roots coming off of. That's the part that gets stripped off when you pull it through an ena. And um, I remember that Nora was talking with me about how she remembers um, having the the bark rolled up into a ball and then they would play with that. And I remember in one of the books I was looking at seeing a picture of her holding one. And um, so the, the outer bark was used and the inner pith was used as well. The inner pith a lot of times just gets discarded these days. Um, and this comes back to the whole idea of that, that idea of trade and this influx of new commodities to think at culture. Well, a long time ago they would use that that long inner pith part to hang. They would hang it up and sometimes, like Nora said, they would put cockles on them and then they would smoke them. And so even the inner pith was used. It wasn't discarded until it was utilized. And I think that's another important component to um, spruce root harvest and production that gets overlooked sometimes um, because today we don't use it to smoke clams. We don't use it to smoke cockles. It just gets pitched because we don't weave with it. Uh, the same goes with this outer bark. Uh, the other reason I wanted to show this slide is because it helped me get into my mind uh, just what it looks like. Uh, being able to see something is really uh, important for me just to process the information. So I wanted to talk about how the the root has two parts, and if this root was here strung out before us like one of these electrical cords, uh, and we could cut it, you could see that um, right where these side feeders grow, there's a natural break in the root. And so what the weavers do is they uh, split the root apart, and then when they split the root in half, then they half the half, and then they half that half, and then they half that half, and if they can, keep having the halves and having the halves until you get your warp and weft to the thickness that you desire so you can weave your material. And this outer, uh, this top part, like if we were to take a knife and cut the root and split all along down the top right there is the part that you see on the outside of the basket or the weft. And then the, the ones that are on the inside part are the warps. So that's like the framework of the basket. And um, a big thanks to Steve Henriksen who provided me with this slide so I could incorporate it into my presentation. Um, and a, another thanks to him and the organizers of this, this Sharing Our Knowledge conference. Um, the next step for harvesting the roots is to build a fire and to roast or to cook them over the, the coals. Um, you prepare the roots by roasting them and pulling them through the ena, the child's toys made from this material. And one of the most important things that you do as a weaver is you rinse your roots when you're done taking that outer bark off because there's a lot of um, debris that is stuck on them. And if you just begin to weave with them, it's going to discolor your work a little bit. Here, this picture isn't uh, as clear as it shows up on the computer, but right behind here is uh, just like the previous slide where you have a we saw a spruce root that has not been stripped yet. And here we see one that's been pulled through the ena. And then down here are the, um, these are warps because they're in circles. When you're 
done splitting your roots, you, you um, put your warps into circles like this, and your weavers or your wefts get put into figure eight like that. Um, one of the things that I also learned um, working, in, working on projects in Dolores's and um, Janice's class is that there are, there's an old custom and a new custom. The old custom, it went along with the, season, the seasonal activities that were being done. Like, uh, for instance, they would go out in the springtime and they would gather their materials and then they might move on to the next camp, for instance, where they start going after their hooligan or the herring eggs or um, whatever, that, like devil's club. And so there's just this progression um, of activities for gathering and gathering foods and items. So they would store them, they would hang them up to dry and they would leave them until they needed to that they needed to use them and then they would begin splitting them and going through the whole process and I remember Nora saying that um, her was it your grandma Eliza she would in the winter time she would go out and sometimes the the creek would be frozen so she would use her fist and just break through the ice to get the water so she could start soaking her roots to begin working them so she could then begin weaving um, and so today we have this idea of um, using rainwater because it doesn't have the additives that the, the cities put in for fluoride and things like that and um, trying to use a natural ingredient just like either from the stream or from the actual rain to, to use with your materials so that it, it doesn't get as uh, contaminated. Um, so the older custom, that's what they would do. They would just go to their water source and utilize that. Um, today, what a lot of the weavers like to do is, as soon as they're done pulling their, the bark off of their roots, is to split them because um, they feel that it's, it's easier to split the roots and to get the same consistency um, with their natural moisture as opposed to letting them dry and then re-soaking them to get them wet and that when you re-wet them, each time you get your materials wet, the cellular structure of the, the root or the cedar bark will begin to deteriorate, and that in turn causes your materials to be weaker, when, and then when you go to weave your baskets or your hats or whatever, your, your materials won't be as strong and sturdy, and they might not last as long. So um, some of the, the weavers today like to split their roots in their natural moisture, and then um, if they're not able to split them right away, they will use a food saver and store them in the freezer. And then when they're ready to start their project, they will pull them out of the freezer and the roots will still have that natural moisture in them. Um, but that's really organized and usually I just let mine dry out. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is uh, one of our clan ancestors. Her name was Katu Du'u. And she was uh, and you can see her here splitting a root. And I really love this photograph because it looks like she's looking off somewhere else and not looking at the root. And I often wonder what she's thinking about. Um, but she was married to a man named Yaquan, and he was of the Tehuidi. And this is one of our Auntie Lori's um, relatives. Yaquan later married Jenny Patty, and this is her great-grandmother, and also her namesake. And um, I just love this picture. I adore it. Did I have anything else to say about it? No? OK, and here's uh, Michelle Martin. She's a Kaipsha. And that's uh, Yarovara. She's a Kanahadi. And they're up there at work splitting some roots and then there's me with a crazy hairdo and my granddaughter, grandmother, Nora. This is when we were in Glacier Bay and we did a lot of artwork there. We, we worked on spruce roots, we worked on sewing and um, singing and dancing and we did all kinds of things. But um, it was really awesome to be there among them because when I was there I got to collect a handful of terms from Kehne and um, um, in turn now using them with some of my students on campus um, will be when we get back after 
the break we'll be um, working on our art projects and we're using um, de Kays weaving, um sewing terms and de Ock weaving terms because we're doing different projects. So um, we're using some of the things that we collected there. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to mention how Kehune has gone back to the ethnography herself and transliterated some a lot of Emmons' work um, that all of the terms that he gathered and put them in today, into today's writing system so learners like myself and my sister and my friends, we can look at it and decode what it says. We can read it and think it and not um, some of the stuff that's written we can't make heads and tails of because it's not in the standardized orthography. So um, I would just like to say uh, for this because it it is useful and it will be useful for generations to come. Um, now I'd like to just talk about some of the different types of baskets. This is a collection of baskets that I got off of the Carnegie Museum's website and um, it shows numerous styles. This large basket here is a berry basket and um, this right here is what we call uh, Sekatana and it's one that you, whoops, it's one that you hang over your neck. Um, and then we have a rattle top and this I believe is just an ordinary basket. It almost looks like a cup though. Um, one of the things I'd like to discuss right now is, is back to that idea of trade and the shift from utilitarian use to an art form. Um, the the Euro-Americans who came to our country began to trade with us and they were after our sea otter pelts and we were basically after whatever was new because we, we never had it, especially beads and cloth and um, the iron. Iron was a real big commodity to us back in the late 1700s and the 1800s. Um, one of the things that I remember researching was that the the Shingit would use these old baskets that they were watertight and it was like a cooking pot to them. They would boil water and or they would put water in the basket and they would have heated rocks placed into the baskets which would then cause the water to boil and then they would cook their food. And um, when all of the iron and metals started coming into our area, we began trading and getting those things which in turn caused our people to start leaving behind this ancient form, this utilitarian um, purpose for weaving. And I just find it really fascinating that it stayed alive because a lot of the things that we took on replaced things, but it didn't necessarily replace this, this art form. Um, it shifted it. It shifted it drastically. Um, the the baskets that you see here look to me like um, they're they were made for the tourist trade and not necessarily for utilitarian use. Um, but like I stated earlier, it's still a part of our economy today, and it still helps support some of our people, even though the purpose of doing this art form is different. Um, the ancient art form of basketry and weaving was becoming more and more obsolete as the thing it began to acquire more material culture. <clears throat> okay. I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to quickly go through a few slides that I have. This is a, a telescope basket or one that was used by an Icht. They would go out and they would drink seawater to help purify themselves. And this was the type of tool that they used to do such. Um, rattle top baskets were highly prized, they were highly sought after by the tourists um, in the, the mid-1800s and a lot of people, a lot of women here in Sitka were weavers and Sitka was a real big hub for spruce root 
production and for um, trading and for selling spruce root baskets and uh, things like that to the tourists and to the Westerners who came to this area. Uh, this is an eye hole basket. Uh, the, the baskets that have the warps that cross with the space in between them are, they were used to gather um, clams and cockles and things like that. And uh, this is a representation of how that, that style, the utilitarian style transferred into the art form, the modern art form. And then it was also in the mid 1800s that aniline dyes were introduced to our people. And when aniline dyes came around, we began using them instead of the natural dye, the natural ingredients to dye our roots and other materials. Um, I know most weavers today, if they want to use a, a weave a design into their work, they use writ. And uh, it's, it's a real bright color, and I think that's one of the reasons that that that's one of the reasons why the baskets were so attractive to the to the newcomers, uh, especially to the tourists, is because of how intricate the designs were and how they utilized the color to represent those designs. But um, this has fallen out of practice with most weavers today. But now some of us are using natural dyes, thanks to Dolores and uh, some of the work that she's doing over in Huna. And I know that's in conjunction with the Heritage Institute. And uh, I um, was able to obtain a copy of the, the ingredients that it takes to make certain colors. And um, the only one that we've tried, well, my sister did it, was with blueberries. And um, that was when we were over in Huna. And, she used uh, blueberries to dye spruce roots, and it turned um, this really beautiful burgundy color, almost like the color of Char's um, jacket back there. It's this real purple burgundy color, and it's absolutely magnificent. Um, so if you're a weaver, ask questions. Try and figure out how to utilize those forms, because they're almost gone from us. And how ah. Uh, Uh, this is an example of a berry basket after the trade times came. You can see the, the, intricate, the intricate designs, the, the weaving is very, very fine, Some very small spruce roots. Um, this is a large burying basket, and um, you can't really see it very well, but right here there's a handle that's been woven into the basket. Um, the berries... Berries among Tlingit people were extremely important, almost as important as the salmon were. And I know many of you know this, especially by, uh, from going to Kluik, when berries come out, there are just smiles from ear to ear, and it's a real happy time, and we always have a lot of fun with that portion of our ceremonies. Um, but one of the other pieces of research I looked at was by Tom Thornton, and he uh, wrote a paper called um or The Buried Landscape, and he studied the berries over there in Glacier Bay and did a lot of work with the elders in Huna and um, talking about what they learned growing up. And uh, his paper was published in the Journal, Ethno Journal of Ethno 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 Ethnology excuse me, in 1999, and he says that Glacier Bay berries were internationally renowned, widely traded, and comprised an important nutritional component of the diet and symbolic element in ceremonial feasts. His study ties the physical and spiritual relationship that Tlingit continue to maintain with the land. Um, berries were also said to hold or represent the landscape from whence they came and thus symbolized Tlingit's material, social, and spiritual ties to the land that nurtured them. And so again, coming back to that idea of place-based education and how to interweave these ideas within the modern day and in classrooms and um, teaching that ideology to children um, so that they learn differently than we learned growing up about natives in schools. Because I know most of us have different ideas of um, what natives were and are and how they were like and things like that. So 
I really uh, am pleased with all of the place-based education work that's going on. Um, so consequently, large burying baskets were of utmost importance for the Shingit. Thousands of berries were picked each season. They were consumed, preserved, distributed, and traded. Um, and one quote that I liked from George Emmons was that the basket fulfilled all of the requirements of the kettle and jar. And uh, Richard Downhower a few years back said that Basketry was the plastic bag of its day. <laughs> um, just a few more examples. Uh, false embroidery is, a, is an extremely tedious task. And here on the color picture, you can see a little better. But on the inside of the basket, you can see how the, the, uh, the design right here is the, the dyed uh, spruce root. But on the outside, like this white and this yellow and this red, this um, shaman's pattern, and I forget if this is flying geese or what that's called, what that design is. But regardless, the, um, that's done in false embroidery. So on the inside of the basket, you don't see the, the twining that's done. You just see it on the outside of the basket. And once again, the, um, the knowledge that these ladies had to weave such beautiful pieces that were used for everyday life and then later on, um, integrating the commodities that they traded for to again, in turn, make baskets and other things that, uh, that they could trade or sell to other Shingits or to Euro-Americans. Um, I'm just amazed at the, the beauty of it and the time that it takes to make these, these items. Is, it's absolutely precious. Here's another basket. This is another uh, a large burying basket with false, false embroidery. Uh, and this is a tosh, which is a large, almost a flat-like basket that was used either to, they, it's a screening basket, or um, what I've heard is that they would go up the mountainside in the fall and go after blueberries, and they take the branch and they hold it over the basket and they tap it and a lot of the berries just fall into the basket instead of picking each individual one. Uh, this is an example of another one. You can't see it that well, but it's fairly large and there are no colors, there are no designs in it, but um, it looks like there is a, it, it's plated spruce root. It, it looks plated, I, I can, it's kind of hard to tell. And then this is just a, a picture of several baskets that were done after contact. You can see the, the very beautiful intricate designs and the rattle top lids and the geometric designs and all of the baskets is an area that I know some people have studied and published work on and I know that Nora also and Nora and Dick, her husband, have worked on um, math and geometry and how to integrate this knowledge within um, the, the, the curriculum of the schools and using this for math and teaching shapes and counting and um, I don't know how they did it but they were sure intelligent. Um, even though most of uh, the designs that you see on baskets I've learned do not belong to clans. They're just designs that weavers would use. Now with that said, there are a few baskets out here in Shinkit Ani that are at U, and this is one of them. This basket is uh, one that comes from the Dukdain Tan clan, and uh, this, if you look in the Downhower's book called uh, Hatuanagu Yis, you'll see a picture of their, their house. And um, this is part of the, the motif that is um, on the side and above the, the doorway. And um, this, is, uh, this is just one of the few baskets that I know of that's an actual piece of atu. Most of the baskets, at least in the research, were just utilitarian. They, they were utilized by the people of the clan. I don't, think, I don't know if they were necessarily clan property. I could be mistaken, though. Yes. OK, I'm almost done. Thank you. Uh, this is another one. It's called the Mother Basket. It belongs to the Kanak Teidi um, from Kwakwan. 
It's huge. It's about 33 inches in diameter and about the same height. Um, the other area that I looked at of weaving was that of hats. And um, the one that I would really like you guys to see is this hat here. I don't, uh, some of you might know about this, but this is the, the brass hat commissioned by Baranov to give to the Khingit here in Sitka after the battle with the Russians. Um, I think it's great to see that uh, he had the, the idea, he knew what Khingit culture was like and how to reciprocate and respond to something that has happened. Um, the last thing that I would like to share with all of you is a poem that I wrote, and it has to do with basketry, and um, I'll just do it. Stained lips, fingertips, blueberry burp, she picks more, not filling basket. <laughs> Once again, my name is Helen Dangle Lorig, and I'm going to be uh, giving the next presentation with Irene Jimmy. I work for Sika Tribe of Alaska, and I'm, I guess it doesn't really matter what my title is. I was a cultural research specialist when I did this project. And Irene Jimmy is a Kick City elder, and I've worked a lot with her and really appreciate the effort. She agreed to do this with me. Do you want to stand up? Irene has, I just can't say too much about her. She has worked to start the Kayani Commission, which is the um, Sacred Tribe of Alaska's plant commission. They look at traditional uses of plants. And through that work, also, um, she's also a, a weaver of baskets and chill cat and, and raven's tail? Yeah. And raven's tail. And um, let's see. So I'll just give a, a overview. Um, this was, uh, this is, we called, I called it, we called it a celebration of weavers because we really, with this project, wanted to honor the weavers. However, this is regarding a specific basket collection, the Doris Borhauer basket collection, which is at, housed at the Sika National Historical Park. Um, and it was sold for a nominal price by Doris Borhauer to the park. And it began, It began, as you can see, that's actually Irene looking in a basket. Um, the Kayani Commission had a conference in 2001, the Ha Kayani Conference, and um, elders had an opportunity to look at some baskets that were in storage that did not, were not ever on display. And maybe you want to say a little bit about that? Thank you. Um, I think it was a great opportunity to look at these baskets that had such skill and such beautiful baskets that were woven, woven by the women from Sitka. I often wondered how, um, because we have a rocky terrain, that we were these women were able to extract roots from this area. But a friend of mine mentioned to me later that um, the Russians did logging in the area so I imagine this is where the um, women in Sitka were able to harvest their roots. And there are a lot of baskets that were produced in Sitka by these women and their skill is, is something else. I don't think that we as weavers here can match their skill. The other factor I'd like to mention too is um, we don't have the access to spruce root. We have to travel to other areas to collect our material. So consequently, we are doing cedar, cedar baskets. And I'd like to acknowledge um, Dolores Churchill. Um, I didn't grow up learning my art. I did this after I retired and did the studying at the National Park with other women. There with Dolores and her mother is where I learned to do the basketry. And I'd like to say thank you to Dolores in honor of her mother. So. Um, 
do what? Um, I'll probably throw a little bit if you want to sit down for a bit. And okay. So, um, Sikha Tribe of Alaska, Robbie Craig, and I, I assisted Robbie a little bit. We wrote a grant for uh, a national, to the National Park Service for a historic preservation grant, which we received. And um, based upon the stories, because it was during this time when I was, Irene and other Cayenne commissioners and other ladies who were involved with the conference were looking at it. I think Shirley Yoakum and um, Jesse Johnny, who else was there? Forget. But there was other ladies there. Started telling stories, and they remembered the women. And um, um, it's kind of one of the unique collections is that when this collection was sold to uh, the National Park, it had notes on each basket and identified. And that's kind of unusual for baskets. At least um, Steve Henriksen told me that it was fairly unusual. Um, and it provided an opportunity to really document this collection because each weaver was identified with each basket, or a lot of the baskets. And they remembered the weavers that were there. And they started to tell stories about them. And, and that's where this uh, started. So this is just a general slide. This is from um, the actual celebration when we had a basket viewing um, after the project was complete. Uh, and we did a basket viewing kind of early on and let some of the weavers look at the baskets. Uh, so they're looking, looking at a number that were brought out of storage. And there's a, a, a berry basket on the upper right that Tosh uh, Hans was talking about. And the bottom basket was a, a basket woven by Lottie Peters. Um, it's a waste basket. I hate to say that. It's one of my favorite baskets, and I know Terry's back there, it's one of her favorite too. And one of the interesting things about this basket, um, it's fairly large, as you can see, and it, it was something we hadn't noticed before, but it actually incorporates some um, techniques from woolen weaving from Raven's Tail and, no, 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 yeah, Raven's Tail. Um, it has, as you can see on the, the right-hand lower corner, she's pointing to a, a, a thing, and maybe it's not so common, but Terry hadn't noticed this in other baskets, was that it's a, a double loop. When you're twining, you go over each root once. And in order to, um, to go from going to a berry pan, a berry, what do you call it, a strawberry pattern to a clamshell pattern right there, They did a double loop, which is something you do in Raven's Tail, and you don't see it very often. Um, so this was just a, a really neat basket. It's, it's simple. It's beautiful in simplicity, but um, well done. Anyway. So uh, this is from another picture, a couple pictures from the celebration. There was like a two-day celebration. The first part was for the descendants of the weavers. So this is some um, not-so-great photos uh, of the descendants who came. And I think a number of them are at this conference, so they n didn't necessarily get to attend this session. Um, Maria Guthrie is one of the descendants. Uh, Jean Boone, that's, that's her. Jean Boone Hamar is actually one of the weavers. She wove a basket when she was a little girl. Um, this is Barbara Lewis. She's one of Carrie Lewis's grandchildren. And um, Sue Thorson and Ramona East, they were part of the collection, or part of the research, they helped me with research a lot. Um, and I have to say, I was just really honored to get to do this because, um, you know, I didn't really start, I wasn't working for Sika Tribe when they initially brought this up. And this, uh, this is a book that got published. So it actually finally got made into published format, um, and it's available for sale if anyone's interested. Uh, so regarding the, the weavers in the collection, Doris Borhauer, well, she didn't donate it. She sold it for a nominal price. But she, um, she was a physical therapist. She worked at Mount Edgecombe for a while. And she actually purchased a lot of her baskets from Lila Berg. Um, and Lila is important because she's the one many of the Native community uh, remember. She, she was a public health nurse. And she worked with the people in the Indian village. Um, one of... Um, one of the people I interviewed said that she rem they remembered she was fearless. She'd go into the tuberculosis households, uh, even though they're contaminated, 
and um, you know tell people about germs and and how to take care of themselves. Um, many of the baskets were exchanged for a home hygiene textbook um, because she taught a home hygiene class for the natives, native ladies in the village about how to to be sanitary. It just wasn't traditionally done quite that way. Um, and she also uh, helped, the, one of the baskets was in payment for a birth, that she helped with a birth, so they gave her a basket. Um, the weavers, um, this is more or less alphabetical by their last name. Annie Andrews, with covering up her last name, um, was the most, she, she had the most baskets in the collection. I don't know if she was necessarily prolific, but she had many of the baskets in the collection. Um, Jean Boone Hamar is her her daughter, um, who she also has a basket in the collection. But these are the 10 baskets uh, Annie wove. Her husband was Alex Andrews, and he was one of the Kaguantan <laughs> clan leaders. And um, a lot of the baskets, um, you know, I interviewed Jean for this project, and I was only able to basically track down and interview um, one or two people for each weaver. I mean, I would have loved to interview everyone who was a descendant, but I just didn't have the time or, or resources to do that. Um, but Jean recalled growing up that they lived a very subsistence, uh, customary and traditional lifestyle. They spent a lot of time out gathering the food in the summers, and Annie wove the baskets in the winter to sell to tourists. They didn't keep any for themselves. They sold them all and they, they bought staples like sugar and flour. They didn't buy, you know, frivolous things. These were, this was necessary. This wasn't just for pocket money. It was absolutely necessary to their existence. Um, this is Jean, uh, Jean Andrews Boonhamar. She lives in Juneau now and um, she was, 12 years old when she wove this little basket and and uh, Lila, Lila Berg bought it and uh, she just thought it was so sweet this little girl wove the basket and I know Jean has made an effort to continue weaving. Um, Jean was only one of two weavers left alive uh, when I did this project and I'll, I'll get to the other one later but it was very interesting to talk to her um, and that's Jean with her step or her father, Alex Andrews. Uh, this is Nellie Aragon. She was another weaver. Um, <clears throat> she has descendants who still live in Sitka. They used to own the Channel Club up until several years ago. But um, her basket was also bought by Lila Berg and then sold to Doris Bauer Borhauer. Um, can't remember all the stories. And this is um, Catherine Benson. This is actually Irene's mom, so I'm going to let her talk about her. Her English name is uh, Catherine Benson. I used to watch her wee, but she tried to instruct me at one time and her fingers were flying so fast I couldn't keep track of them so I just gave it up. But uh, I know she liked the real fine roots and she did a lot of basketry uh, around town and sold a few um, and did some bartering. The one thing I'd like to mention that doesn't pertain to my mother is a, is a remnant of um, piece of basket they found out on one of these islands out here that, that was carbon dated to be 5,000 years old, which we think belonged to the Kiksadi, which I'm a clan of. And I thought that it was some, the technique they used then, as far as you could tell, um, was the same technique we use now. So. Besides my mother and myself, and I have a daughter and a granddaughter who are also interested in basketry. So, konnichiwa. Konnichiwa, Irene. 
and that was, you know, one of the threads I found that was so special during this project was that um, although it was interesting that the weavers made the baskets for tourist trade and sold them, and then it kind of died out. People didn't teach it to their daughters. But even though they didn't necessarily learn, like Irene didn't learn from her mother, there was others who did learn. Um, they learned from Dolores and her mother. And it's, it's like uh, almost a part of your genetic heritage that people who are descendants of weavers, it seems to me, are especially drawn to learn, to make an effort to learn to weave the, the baskets. And um, the tradition continues, even though they don't, they didn't get to learn from their mothers and grandmothers. They, they've really tried to keep that up, and I think that's really special. Um, Lydia Charles is actually a Haida weaver. These are, um, these are spruce root baskets, though, that she wove. And uh, Nelson Frank, who's a, a local Haida elder, remembered her and remembered learning from her. He, he's a, one of those rare male weavers. <laughs> um, but um, he, those, there's, this one's kind of interesting because uh, there's a little kettle. And if you're a weaver, you know that those little feet, you have to start each of them themselves and hook them in, and they're very difficult to do. So they're interesting. And, and that's her family. Um, I believe many of her children died. She lived a hard life, but she, she, uh, she grew up in Kassan and moved to Klinkwan when she married Powell Charles. And then they moved to Heidelberg. I have to cheat. I can't remember anymore. Um, Chris, Mrs. Christine Davis, she was uh, identified with this basket, but I could not really find any information on her. Um, she had a pretty little basket. Um, I think I found her in the US census uh, that she was married to Peter Davis. And they might have had a baby. Weldon Davis, who died in the Korean conflict. But she doesn't have any descendants. If anyone knows of her, let me know. Next one is also much the same, Kitty Dawson. I couldn't really ever find very much about her other than her basket, and that she was, <coughs> she was perhaps married to George Davis. Um, Miss Catherine Dimitri, Mrs. Catherine Dimitri, is Bob Sam around? You want to come up for a minute? <laughs> um, I think Ms. a lot of people uh, knew Mrs. Dimitri. She lived in the Indian village, and um, and people remembered her. I know Bob talked about when he was a young boy having a little red wagon that he would pull down to the village. Want to talk about your back? It was a very good interview. You have to forgive me. I was pulled into another session, and I wanted to be here, so I had came back, and I'm still being pulled over there. The, the, I have some very fond memories when I, when I, I recall these ladies, these fine ladies. One of my favorite jobs was was to, especially for my grandmother, was was these little red wagons. Those those uh, uh, they, the the ladies always used to 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 sell all their basketry and and dolls in front of the right downtown, middle of downtown, and and one of my favorite favorite memories. Of 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 uh, these ladies is is they asked me if I would uh, take the wagon down there and prepare prepare the wagon for for them to come down and I got a quarter and and a quarter was a lot of money for <laughs> for us little kids and so my my this this lady when my mother uh, moved to Sitka uh, this lady is of the Tlinadi. And and when when and my mother moved to Sitka, 
this lady took my mother in, and, and this lady was like a true mother to my, my mother. She, she lived in, in, a, in a house in the middle of the village, and it was, it was a house that had a, a, a bear in front of the house. It was a, a, a true Canadian house. Her husband was a true Canadian, uh, Tom Dimitri. And what I remember most about this house and that, that stone bear that was uh, around this house, around the house, it was one of the few houses that had a fence around the house. And I kind of resented that, that fence because as a small child and my parents would be, be going up downtown and I knew they were going to, to have a good time downtown, they'd, they'd walk by this, her house and they'd pick me up on the, on, on be, uh, pick me up out of my stroller and put me in her yard, and and I couldn't I couldn't crawl over the fence, and and so I was stuck there for for the rest of the afternoon, but but I really have some really good memories of these ladies, and and I could remember seeing them downtown selling selling their basketry and and selling their moccasins and and. And one day, uh, Mrs. Taranoff uh, had, had a store right down, uh, Taranoff store. She, she's a very good friend of mine. She came out one day out of the store and she had this little doll that was done by my grandmother and she handed it to me. And it's, this little doll is a treasure to me because it's, it's the only thing that I have that reminds me of my grandmother. And, and, and if any of you know what it feels like to sit in your grandmother's lap, everywhere I go, I, I carry this doll with me. So uh, in closing, what I'd like to say best about this project and what they did, and I'd like to thank Steve Johnson for doing it in my place, we know where most of them are buried. So before this project went forward, we went up and to visit their graves. So that's a custom that we did, and, and I hope that we continue to do such a thing to honor these fine ladies. You should honor, also go up and honor where they're buried at. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Bob. So that was about Ms. Dimitri. Ms. Lucy Frank um, is, she's a Haida lady. She lived in, in uh, Cake. She is Della Cheney's grandmother. And Della told me a, a story, it's a little bit long, but I want to read it from the book because it was so sweet. Um, and Della, Della's a weaver herself. She said, I was telling my mother last time I was home that now I'm a weaver. I know, what my, my, I know my grandmother very well because I harvest and process and weave. I know her now better than ever because it was, if she was here, if she, had been, if she had taught me how to weave, this is the way I would have learned. I was lucky enough to go with her when she was like 84 years old. I went to Masset with my mother and she wanted to go harvest bark because I was there. Maybe that's when Grandma Lucy planted the seed in my mind that I had to weave, but I didn't know it then, I was younger. That was when I was just getting out of high school, I think, in the 60s. I went down there and we went out to that place. We went there and she started to show me how to find the right tree and how to start cutting into the bark, and then how to start lifting the bark up off the tree. And it went way up, real fast, when she took it, fr when she took it from me. I was being very gentle, and she took it from me, and she was just like shaking out a wet towel. Started to move that bark. You know, it was about six or eight inches wide. Then it went up high. It must have went up maybe 35 feet or so on that one tree. Of course, how do you get it down, was my question. Mother asked her in Haida, and she said she started to twist it, and she pulled down really hard on it, and, didn't, and it didn't break off, of course, the first time. So we changed our position on the ground from standing near the tree. We moved out farther to the right and right side or left, and then she twisted it some more. Then she gave it to me because I was younger and stronger, is what my mother told me. So I did what she did. I pulled it really hard. You have to do it real quick, 
kind of snap it off, but I didn't, it didn't break. Grandma, she was looking at me, smiling. She reached over for it. Next thing we knew, she was on the other side of the tree, Della laughed. She had swung on the bark, and she was old, you know. <laughs> she swung from that side of the tree to the other side of the tree. It didn't break. You have to understand, she's harvesting on a hill, so when you start on the uphill side, and she swung around to the, to the other side, and she's hanging on to this bark. And she was old, you know, and she swung from the, it didn't break. She was small. She must have been, when we were out there, she must have been around five feet, if that, stretching it. And she must have weighed about maybe 100 pounds. She was real short and small. She swung, and she had this funny face on when she got to the other side, looking at me. And then she started twisting it again and again, and then it snapped off really hard. I just remember it was like a ribbon. The cedar bark was coming out of the sky towards us. She said something in Haida, and Mother said, move! I got out of the way just in time because it came down right towards me. Della laughed. That was really something. Then she started taking the outer bark, you know, like she was hand washing something. I remember that pretty clearly because I was really watching her because she had swung on it for one thing. I didn't <laughs> think she'd do that. So, how, so she had gotten my attention all right, but she had a sense of humor that was very spontaneous. Um, Mrs. Frank died in the 1970s, and she was really very old. Um, Della thought she was maybe 106, so she looked quite a long time. But I, that was one of the neat stories. Um, Stella Jackson, her, I think of her granddaughter, Laverne, Laverne, Peters is still alive and in the Pioneer Home, and I did talk to Laverne, but she, she didn't. She remembered her grandma. She remembered where she lived. She remembered her weaving, but she, she didn't remember too much. But she was is still alive and around. Um, Agnes Bellinger. Um, I think many of you know Agnes. Clarissa Hudson talked about her in the opening ceremonies, and she passed away recently. She was one of the two weavers that was still alive when I was interviewing for this project, and that's also very special because I, I didn't really expect to find anyone still, I, I don't know if this is a bad thing to say, still living, but to find someone who, um, who was, was special and um, the, the name listed with this basket was Agnes Jacobs, so I had no idea, um, you know, it was connected to Agnes Bellinger until Nora Downhauer clued me in. That was one of her former names. And she's the daughter of Jenny Tlanot, so she learned some weaving. Um, she only made, I believe, two baskets. This is one of the two that she made and sold. And if any of you know Agnes Bellinger, you know that she didn't have her full vision and she had never had her full vision. So she did this kind of by touch. And her mother um, got out a bear tooth and really polished it and made it into a nice basket. Um, so if you consider this basket was made by someone who didn't have their full vision, you know that this is a good basket because basketry takes a lot of work. And I just want to... Um, honor her memory because it was good to have her and to, she's, she's an Isaiah clan and it was really, really special to interview her and find that out and go, oh, you're Kogwantan? I'm Kogwantan. You're good shit. <laughs> uh, and there's another picture of her when she's younger. Uh, Fanny James is from Angoon and she did really fine work. Um, her daughter is Selena Everson, who's been in this conference. And um, Selena remembered her mom weaving. And, um, and Selena's daughters, Katrina Mitchell and Donnell, Donnell, I know Donnell, uh, they both are weavers also. Um, I'll just read a brief quote from Selena. Since she's not here to talk about her mother herself, she said, um, she had the old-fashioned five-gallon coffee cans and she had dye in it. She would lie the spruce root in there until they took the color. I can just see in my mind how she did her roots when she was dyeing it. So she just remembered about um, 
about how she dyed the roots. Uh, Mrs. John D. James was a bit of a mystery. Very few people remembered her, um, but her husband had a shop down in the village and they sold, I believe, grocery goods. And I did some research in the census. Actually, Steve, Steve Johnson Sr. Um, remembered her. Um, she says she used to tease her husband by calling him Johnny Jim. He didn't like that. And he remembered that she had, a, she had baskets in their home. Um, and she had two daughters that you can see in the, in the photo. I, at least I believe this is them. They were in the census. Um, Alice, who was 13 years old in the census, and Emma, who was nine years. That was in the 1920. And then in the next census, they, didn't, they weren't there anymore, and no one remembers her daughters, so I think they might not have, uh, they might have passed on from something. Just a reminder that this is hard times and people children often died in childhood. And she had fairly, those are very big, big baskets like this with the little tabs. Those are big baskets, they're both um, big berry baskets. Um, Mrs. Lily Hulis John, um, her granddaughter Andrea Craig is still around and Andrea remembered her pretty well. And she did those little baskets and um, I probably should move along here. So there was a, a, a basket by an un unidentified relative of Mrs. Hulis, and didn't know who that might be. Uh, Mrs. Susie Joseph wove these ones, which are matching colors, and you can kind of see the um, dye job going into the inside, that the black went through, but the false embroidery is on the outside. Uh, Mrs. Katie Kitka wove these two baskets. Um, <coughs> that one is just the, the back side of it. Um, she's the mother of Herman Kitka and Maria Guthrie and Liz Walters of Juno. And they remembered her weaving very well. If you know, let's see, how does this work? There it is. This is Herman. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Carrie Lewis was one of the weavers in the village. Um, Bertha Karras remembered her. She was her adopted grandma. And uh, she was really smart. Um, she, she taught English and she uh, was one of the first natives to vote. Bertha talked about how Mrs. Ch Lewis was challenged to know the co Constitution before she could vote. She was one of the first ones who, when, that when they voted, they told her she couldn't vote unless she knew the Constitution of the United States. Then she told them, you say it, then I'll say it. They couldn't say it, so they let her vote. <laughs> she, was, uh, she was a strong personality, apparently, and she was smart. And if you know basket weaving, um, when you weave, you weave out on a round basket. So this is a really complicated pattern to involved when you're adding warps all the time because you're, it's expanding like a sun, like rays. And that means that she must have been very good to weave this basket. Um, and Barbara Lewis remembered her too, that she couldn't touch the table. She'd keep her baskets on a table, a card table covered up with a, a, a cloth. And no one was to touch that cloth under pain of death. She never knew what was under there but that the baskets, she's, she thought the baskets must have been under there. Um, Grandma Littlefield, Mrs. Martha White, I, I never found a picture of her. Uh, she is the great grandmother of Don Littlefield and the Littlefield clan. Um, she, she was the wife of the first Littlefield, what's his name? I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, Charles Littlefield, no, I'm sorry, John Littlefield the first. He was the Englishman on the the British Navy boat that was here, the, the Jamestown, that Jamestown Bay is named after. She, she was married to John Littlefield who was on that boat. And um, 
her daughter-in-law, Marion Bartlett Littlefield, oh. I didn't feel very fine very much on that. This uh, this basket is actually a broom handle cover. If you believe that, they wove, you know, they wove for the tourist trade, and she made a little thing. And I can't imagine putting a precious basket on top of my broom, but there it is. Um, Mrs. Mary Marks has many descendants in town. Camille Ferguson is one of them, and um, she was one of the people everyone remembers. That, that picture in the lower right-hand corner is uh, one of her weaving that was published in the newspaper. And um, you can see the bottom here of this glass. Uh, it was traditional of weavers in that age that they would put little cardboard pieces on the bottom of the baskets to protect them. And um, I guess Doris just never cut it off. She thought it was better to keep it there, but it was, it was just to protect it while they're weaving. And um, do you remember her? This was one of the ones uh, people, I, I, I always associate because Camille remembered the story that the Browns in here were, um, they got their dye from different places and uh, they remembered uh, the ladies, the elders who were remembering the weavers talked about how they used chocolate bar wrappers, Hershey's chocolate bar wrappers. It was different then that they would soak off the, the, the Hershey bar wrappers, they'd soak them with the roots and that was how they got their brown dye. And then Camille said when they changed the formula or they changed something printing process, it didn't work anymore. But that's what they used for the dye in there. So that's kind of, that's one of the stories. That was, um, the other picture was her with her sisters. Mrs. Mary Miller, um, this is, these are some of the, some of the oldest baskets in the collection. These were actually utilitarian. The, the baskets, uh, the families from Cake, um, I didn't, these were from the late 1800s, and George Skeek is the grandson of Mary Miller, and his mother, seated below, um, this is George, and his mother, Helen Skeek. Helen was the one who actually sold them, and she's, she, she was alive. I talked to her daughters. Um, George is not around anymore, but uh, her granddaughters, no, her, no, her, and um, I'm sorry. And she didn't remember selling them, but it, it clearly states in the notes that she did. Most of these were utilitarian baskets, berry baskets, the tough, and and um, they've obviously been repaired extensively. And then this one was made by Mary Miller's mother. It was a seaweed basket that was actually used for cooking seaweed on the fire, like Hans was talking about. That they'd build a fire and they put this on the uh, they put hot coals, they'd heat the, the rocks with the hot coals and they drop them in the basket. And that's why I showed the bottom of this because it's been repaired so much um, because they used, they, they cooked the seaweed in it. Um, Selena Paradovich was, um, I, I interviewed Dolores about her mother and she's I think she's a real touchstone in the community because she really stuck her neck out trying to teach. Um, she taught Haida weaving to people in, in Klinkit territory, which just wasn't done, you know, outside of clan bounds. And, and um, do you want to say a couple words about her? Have, I'll have Dolores talk about her mom. But she, um, she really taught many of the weavers around today. She was really amazing because she taught Haida basketry all the way from Prince of Wales Island right up to Bethel. In fact, the reason that I learned Lingard basketry was she was really a perfectionist. She would not let me touch any of the bark or the roots. And so I, I had worked in a hospital. I was a bookkeeper, actually assistant to the controller at Ketchikan General. And I was used to, they never used to have social service in the hospitals. And I was used to going up and asking old people if they wanted me to write letters or if they wanted me to go to the store for them. And so while I was teaching with her here at the cultural center, I went up to the uh, Pioneer Home. And there was a woman there who had had a stroke 
And she was really despondent, and she was laying there, and I asked her, do you want me to do anything? Do you need me to write letters, or is there anything you want me to do? No, my daughter lives here. She said, her name's Bertha Karras, and she does all that for me. And I, as I was leaving, I couldn't get her to talk very much, and as I was leaving, I had a handful of spruce roots in my pocket. I said, could I leave these with you, Annie? No, I can't see. I said, look, it's so much fun to gather spruce roots. Why don't you put it under your pillow and dream about the times when you used to harvest spruce roots? And so she said, oh, okay. So then I left, and I didn't come back for two or three days. Well, when I got back there, the nurses at the nurse's station said, go see Annie right now. So I went there. Here she is sitting up. And she shows me this weaving. She had woven the base of a basket with that little bit of spruce root I left to her. And because she had had a stroke, I could see how she wove. Because otherwise, those women were so fast, and they would not slow down. Even my mother, she had no patience with me. <laughs> she had, it, in fact, I wove with her for five years before she even let me put a basket up for sale. And yet my daughter, April, my oldest daughter, was weaving, and she was selling all of her work. But here I am, my baskets are being burned by my mother. <laughs> but thank goodness, my husband was kept saying, oh, they're beautiful, they're beautiful. In fact, after I had been weaving like for five years, and I had finished a basket, and I went to my mother's, and she said, it's still not good enough. And my husband, I didn't know he came in after me. He was behind me. He said, mother, that's enough. She's, that's a beautiful basket. I'm taking it. And so that was when I finally, my basketry was accepted. But then the university asked me if I would teach basketry because I could do the Haida, Simsian, and Thingit by then. And they want, you know, the, and every community has so many different cultures, so they asked me if I would teach at night. Well, I went to my mother because she's my teacher. I said, Mother, the university has asked me to teach. Isn't that wonderful? She looked at me and she said, you're not ready. I said, what? <laughs> she said, you never prepare your own material. I said, I don't prepare my own material because you do it all. <laughs> so for two more years, I had to learn how to prepare material before she let me teach that class. <laughs> Thank you. I guess Hawa. Hawa. <clears throat> um, one of the things that was interesting about interviewing Dolores about her mother was her mother um, was raised by her grandmother and she got married young and she learned to weave from her her mother-in-law, right? And she wouldn't, sh the mother-in-law wouldn't teach her at first because she had young children. She said, no, no, won't teach you. And she just watched her mother-in-law for a long time, and then one day she produced a basket and gave it to her mother-in-law. And that's when her mother-in-law decided that it was okay to teach. And I think that's interesting because her daughter April, Dolores talked about her daughter April, that it's the same thing that April would just watch um, Selena weave, and she, she wasn't gonna teach her, but then April produced a basket, and that's when, Selena decided to teach. It's kind of an interesting little rep repeat in that family that you don't get to learn until you produce a basket. <laughs> uh, um, Lottie Peters um, was one of the ladies in the village and she has many baskets and these are her baskets that uh, one I noted before. Um, she, her daughter, Andrea Craig is the daughter of Ida Peters, um, and Andrea is the one I, I, um, I interviewed. Um, her father was Yakov Plotnikov, which is uh, now known as Jacob Carpenter. That's the Russian. Yakov Plotnikov is, is, is Russian uh, for Jacob Carpenter. And, um, Andrea just mostly remembered that her, her grandma took care of 
them while her mother went to work and that, you know, she doesn't remember her weaving too much because she probably did it after she went to bed. Um, Isabel Sam. This was uh, Bob Sam's grandmother, his paternal grandmother. Do you want to say something? I know uh, she was really special and she had tea parties with the other lady, lady weavers. Do you want to say a quick word about her? And she raised Bob. Um, she raised Bob. I actually stayed just for this picture. I really miss this lady. She's a she's a sister to to uh, Kat, uh, Katie Kitka. They're they're two true sisters. Uh, what I'd like to say, and it's kind of related to to what Hans just Hans was mentioning about gender. I'm trying, I'm trying to keep this very short because I have to go over there. Uh, uh, maybe you'll see, find some humor in this. My grandmother is a fine clinket woman, a very fine woman, and and I was raised by her. And and one thing I noticed growing up in her house, a lot of really strong clinket men would come and visit our house. And in real life. Hans, in real life, they walk around real strong, you notice? You notice your husbands, they're walking around real strong? Mm -hmm. Soon as they catch a cold or a flu, <laughs> they go, I want my mommy. <laughs> this is the kind of lady that, that served as a mommy to a lot of people. And I just wanted to mention that, Hans. You know, because because we do respect our women, and, but and and we do need them, but but there's also a time we also need to be strong too, yeah. and 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 that that uh, I agree with what you you said, and I and and it's my grandmother that taught me that. Konishtish. Konishtish. I gotta wrap this up. <clears throat> um, Bob remembered his grandma used to have lunches with the other ladies in the village who would come over and they'd talk linga and they'd weave. So that was an interesting story. Um, Sally Stutine was from Cake. Uh, there wasn't very many people who remembered her. She had a, a daughter, Louise, uh, who married Jim Kalsonk and, and uh, I think it was Louise Johnson. She was pretty well known. She was married to Frank Johnson, who was a member of the legislature. Um, this basket was called, uh, said it was woven by Mrs. Tlinkatla. Uh, no one ever remembered a Mrs. Tlinkatla or whatever. People thought it was probably woven by Mary Tlantich, and she was um, involved in an incident in the village when uh, the native men were going to attack the, the Russian. Russians and she was sent as a messenger to warn them. And she was very well known. She was given a, a medal of honor and a, a, a pension for the rest of her life because she helped prevent uh, a war, a battle. Uh, this basket, we had, I had Dolores look at it and she, it was identified as woven by Mrs. Agnes Williams. There wasn't an, an Agnes Williams from uh, Masset, I believe, but Oh. some of her baskets and they look just the same background. Oh. Her children, her grandchildren have it. So it's, it is actually Agnes Williams. Oh. Well, it was confusion if there was Agnes Williams or Agnes Galtazzi. I did uh, talk to Agnes Galtazzi's daughter and she did weave a lot. Um, and she was special, but Agnes Williams I didn't get to research as much. I believe she has descendants. Dick Massett. Dick Massett? Oh, in Masset, yes, she does. But Agnes does, too. Agnes L. Tatsy did do a lot of weaving, and she is Charles Edenshaw's uh, daughter. Right. Charles Edenshaw's daughter is what. Agnes L. Tatsy was Charles Edenshaw's daughter. Um, the last of the known is uh, Mrs. Charlie Williams. She wove this trio of little ba berry baskets. And I talked to, um, to her granddaughter, and her grandson, Earl Williams, and um, Emma Farquhar, Anne Farquhar, it's her granddaughter. And 
Anne's identified as one of the um, owners of one of the baskets. Her mother sold these baskets that were supposed to belong to um, the granddaughters of Mrs. Williams. And Anne said she never had that basket, but it's interesting that she wove these little baskets and said they belonged to her granddaughters and they were sold actually at different times, but they all made it in, no, no, they were sold the same year, Never mind. And to wrap it up, um, there were a number of baskets by Sika weavers, just so they were Sika, they didn't know who they were, but there are some really fine specimens of baskets, so I thought I'd show the picture of them. And then by South, Southern, no, Southeast Alaska weavers, there's two pictures. No, this is still Sika weavers, I'm sorry. Um, and these are by other Southeast Alaska weavers. There's rattle tops and a china bowl look alike and, and uh, this one was identified as a macaw basket, but it was woven out of spruce root and completely covered in false embroidery. But some weaver actually, um, it, it's in the style of the macaw weavers, and they actually took the time and effort to, to look at that macaw basket and copy it. I think that's interesting that they really, it wasn't, they didn't just stand spruce roots, they looked around them and saw what else was going on, and they tried to mimic that. The same thing with the, the the bowl, they even it's like a china bowl. They even did a little false rim there, like a china bowl. And and this one is the eldest basket in the collection. It was woven in 1850, and uh, we had a theory that this looks like some of the Chinese, the blue willow pattern, the Chinese designs on the blue willow, um, and that's actually uh, woven. The, the black there is maidenhair fern. It's not grass. It's maidenhair fern embroidery. So, um, and this is the last picture. This is Mary Marks. Um, Camille Ferguson, her granddaughter, found this. And she was actually selling baskets on Lincoln Street. And at the very end of this, um, all the way down there, where they have a fuel terminal, that's where the cruise ships used to come in and the tourists got off the, the steamships and came down Lincoln Street and bought baskets and berries from the native ladies. So um, this is just everyone who helped with the project. I'm sure I'm forgetting people I can't mention, but I need to move along. So thank you to everyone who let me interview them. And it's really not my project. It was the stories of the weavers and their descendants. And I'm just honored to have been able to work on this and work with elders like Irene. She really, she was instrumental in starting this and the other ladies who, um, who wanted this. So I was just lucky to be able to get to work on it. Thank you. Gunos chish. Okay, good afternoon, or is it good evening? <laughs> I did check with Dolores and asked her if she would like to go next, and she said no. So she's going to make us all hold out here. So we, we Dolores and I, and uh, we've had two great speakers already. I've really appreciated Hans and Helen and the great work they're doing. So uh, we're still happy to be here. Us weavers could be here till midnight, but we won't. It's just a threat. Anyway. Uh, I'm Dawn Glinsman, and I'm, my topic is Diagnostic Features of 18th Century Spruce Root Hats. I want to thank Steve Henriksen for inviting me to speak today, the National Science Foundation and the Sitka Tribe of Alaska for the funds which assisted in my attending this conference, and Robin Wright here in the second row for her continued input and guidance. I also want to thank my weaving teachers especially Diane Douglas Willard of Ketchikan, Lisa Telford of Everett, Washington, and Dolores Churchill of Ketchikan. Whoops. Back in 1999, as a graduate student at the University of Washington, I wrote a paper in which I discussed the particulars of weaving technology in Haida spruce root basketry using observations of weaving techniques as diagnostic features for regional and individual hat attribution. This led to spruce root hats, not only of the Haida, but from throughout the northern northwest coast. I spent the next four years finding and examining 206 of these hats. This research formed the basis of my dissertation entitled 
northern northwest coast spruce root hats. I typically spend 45 to 90 minutes with each hat. And as we've already heard, it's actually spending time with the weaver when you're with her work. And it's actually wonderful time uh, looking at the techniques in a hat. The braiding techniques are so confounding that I used eight colors of plastic lanyard cord to learn to identify the more complex structures. So there's actually eight colors used here and there's eight strands here. This is two string twining and then a, a uh, six strand braid running through it. Over time, I have developed a relational database for physical features, photographs, and collection information. And indeed, I have discovered at least four weavers not before identified using detailed attention d to specific weaving techniques. I have also traced certain techniques through major collections spanning from 1775 to 1910. Before I proceed further, however, I want to disclose my own biases, backgrounds, and perspectives. It is my identity as a non-native and as a weaver which positions me and my work in several ways. Over time, I have been able to study with four Haida weavers and have also acted as a teaching assistant to Dolores Churchill in her weaving classes in Seattle and Huna. This learning process has not only sharpened my eyes as a researcher, but has also led to dialogue with numerous native weavers on the Northwest Coast. It is in these dialogues that we find another way of knowing, and that is community knowledge. And here's Dolores, and also Harlena Warford is here today, so I'm just thrilled, uh, from Huna and her uh, niece Darlene. So I'm happy you guys are here. Of course, just as there is no unified, and Hans talked about this too, there's no unified and or static so-called native voice, there's also no single source of knowledge or inquiry among weavers. What my research has confirmed is an extensive network of exchange of weaving knowledge among all groups on the Northwest Coast. In fact, the variations I find contribute to a freeing up of the fixed identity so often assigned to native women. So what of my intentions? I chose this project for my dissertation because in the footsteps of my advisor, Robin Wright, I wanted to acknowledge individual artistry. I also wanted to bring weaving techniques and other knowledge, which had perhaps been lost or neglected, back to weavers of the Northwest Coast. I've been able to accomplish this to some degree by visits to Haida weavers on Haida Gwaii, by participating in a weaving class with and presenting my weave research to Tlingit weavers in Huna, and by numerous conversations with weavers up and down the coast. It is in these dialogues that I find the most satisfaction and hope to expand on what I have done. So the 206 hats I've examined so far fall roughly into four time periods. Ancient, which uh, is about, the ones we found are 900 to 1400 AD. Late 18th century, and then a little break to early 19th century, and then late 19th century. Late 18th century hats hold several features in common with ancient hats and with 19th century hats. On the other hand, these same hats have such a variety of techniques and combinations of those techniques that it is safe to say that at the most, two hats that I examined from this period are from the same weaver or even the same tutelage. These are the two here that have a remarkable amount of like features. They are both at the Museo de America in Madrid. And the Madrid collection uh, spans several Spanish voyages between 1779 and 1792. We can't match hats to voyages, but that's their time frame. Even with the variety present in the 18th century, four features are found in both Tlingit and Sugpiak, also called Alutic, hats of this period which disappear in hats of the 19th century. And it's these four features that I want to talk to you about today. The four features are braided twining used as fabric, use of warps in the ending braid, brim pattern details, and red marks on the interior of the hat. 
here are the basic parts of a hat. And the, I, I apologize that, that the writing is so small, but you've got the start where she starts out with her spokes and the top and the top turn where she turns off the top and goes on to the crown. And then she turns, she makes a transition and goes to the brim. And then she does an ending, which is usually some kind of braid or series of twining. And you see these here, top, uh, start, top, turns, uh, the turn here, crown, another turn, and her brim and braid. And the whole fabric, sometimes we talk about what the hat is, you know, when she makes the fabric. So we'll, we'll call this the fabric uh, of the hat. What, what stitch is she using? And just to be clear, excuse me, there are other details in painting materials and other features that distinguish Tlingit and Supiak hats but we don't have time for those features today. We're just looking at 18th century features. So, feature one, braided twining as fabric. This is the technical part of the talk, and I'll make it brief. This is a technique published in Fraser's Guide to Weft Twining and in Cheryl Samuel's The Raven's Tale. Generally, Samuel calls this braided twining, which may be parallel or perpendicular to the warps. So if your warps are here, it's either parallel to them or perpendicular. Resulted in a braided look or a twined look, respectively. If you look at it from the side, it's, it looks twined. And in all these hats, the braid lies within and perpendicular to the warps and thus appears as twining. Interestingly, the technique is used in both Yilkowu and Nahin, Raven's Tail and Chilkat weaving today. And that basket in the Boerhaus collection used a raven's tail technique, so that was exciting too. Now a technique that looks very similar to this is a simple two-strand twine with false embroidery using fine spruce root as the decorative element. So here I've used the plastic lanyard, the plastic lanyard here with plastic slats here. I just used a yogurt cup and cut up into it. Uh, white and yellow twining, and then the red never passes through those warps. That's your false embroidery. This, this is used long after the 18th century. It's used today by, by a lot of people. An excellent example then of the braided twining is on a hat in Florence, Italy, collected in 1778 on Captain Cook's third voyage. Because the hat was broken at a point where there was tw braided twining, I was able to photograph cross sections of it, thereby differentiating it from false embroidery. And here you can see these are the broken warps, and you see the, the uh, wefts braided around those warps, and they're perpendicular to it. They're not on top, so it looks like twining here on the outside. But without such fractures in the fabric, how can you tell the difference between the rolled on uh, false embroidery and the braided twine? And in this picture, you can see uh, the the False embroidery has more of a rolled look. It's at t on the top, and then on the bottom is the uh, braided twining, and it penetrates the warps and has a flatter look to it. And these hats are both from the Field Museum in Chicago. Here again, a lanyard illustration of false embroidery versus the braided twining. Both of these Techniques can be confused with a simple S braid. And S braids are, and I'm just going to skip ahead for time purposes, but here's an S braid from the back. You can tell that it's different from this Z twining here. Anybody, even if you don't, aren't familiar with weaving, you can see that this is, is opposed to these here. And so, so you can tell immediately if it's S twine just by turning the work over. So here's what's significant. I found that in three instances, the braided twining is used not only as a transitional device, a single row, as in later hats all throughout the 19th century, but to actually construct the fabric of the top and crown. This fabric making occurs all the time in Raven's Tail and Chilk Hat, but not in basketry. In this Sugpiat hat, collected in the 18th century, this is one of the, whoops, yeah, this one, 
One of the Madrid hats. Braided twining is used throughout the top of the hat. The light was dim, so I've really contrasted and, and taken the color out so you can see this. In this photograph of the start, note how the braid in the eighth row has slipped out of place, protruding above the fabric, and providing a clear view of the technique used. See that right there? It's a braid, and it's slipped up out. The next hat is Vienna, is in Vienna. It is a Tlingit hat and was collected on Cook's third voyage. It contains a few delightful surprises. First of all, false embroidery is used over the first seven ro rows at the start, which is so difficult to do. But it's not spruce root false embroidery. It is likely made in hair fern, but I'd like to hear, uh, after the talk, I'd love to hear your comments on what that might be. Not only is this type of start unique, there are, is another element of virtuosity at play here. The false embroidery over plain twining transitions to a fabric of the braided twining. You can see the transition here, where she goes around, and she ends up here. And it doesn't just keep being false uh, embroidery and just switching from maidenhair fern to spruce root. There's actually a change in technique right in here. Here's the interior. Oh, whoops. Uh, and also here, you can see this is the edge of the top. This is straight down. And she's changing her technique here again to use false embroidery at the very edge of the top. <clears throat> Here's the interior of the top, just to show that it's a surface decoration. It's not penetrating the warps. In fact, like the Madrid hat we just reviewed, the entire top and crown are made using the braided twining. And this is the end of the crown. And uh, you can see the end of the braided twining here. And this is the inside shot right there where the crown ends. John, is that braided twining, is it uh, three or four? Three. But it can, in diagrams I've seen it four, but I'm thinking these are all three because the stitches are so short. Do you have the other? So this stitch right here is where the crown ends, because that's the last skip stitch, or this is the first skip stitch. She's coming around here, and then here's her first skip stitch. Uh, and, and, there's, and then she goes into her crown. So you can't, you can see it very obviously here, but so her braided twine ends about there. Finally, like the two hats just reviewed, one in Madrid, one in Vienna, the fabric making up the entire top and crown of another Cook Voyage hat, this one in Florence, Italy, consists of three strand braided twining. So the second feature, that was the longest and most technical, so from here it's a breeze. The second 18th century feature I want to note is the use of warps in the, end, in the ending. The warps are turned up into the braid and not cut off. Note how the underside appears a simple two-strand twining here, with the exception of these warps being folded up into it. This is just two different sections of it. This is where she's actually ending the whole hat. She's tying everything off, but uh, this is from the reverse. Uh, and the red twining just above the ending on the outside is a row of braided twining. So that's this right here. Look at this still. And then this is, is the braid, the ending braid itself. There are several other hats that have a similar ending to this, all from the 18th century. As far as any hats in the 19th century with this, there are two that I've looked at, and they're collected by Emmons. They have the warp ends bent up. One is at the field and one is at the Burke in Seattle. Finally, both known surface hats uh, that we know of, the hat belonging to long ago person found, dated 1415 to 1445, and the Katete River hat dating AD 1730 to AD 1810. Both of those hats have the warps bent up. The third feature for review today is brim pattern. I've examined four 18th century hats that have the following elements. A shallow profile, painted crown, an upper left to lower right brim pattern. And here you can see, barely, you can see these radial lines flaring out from upper left to lower right. And that occurs on all of these. 
Also from the 18th century, two hats both have a painted crown with an upper right to lower left pattern. After the 18th century, after uh, the end of the 18th century, it is much more common to see a variety of other designs, but not those two in that combination. Finally, the most intriguing to me, the, the feature, it's the fourth feature, is the presence of red marks on the interior of certain hats. There are six hats in early European collections that I know of that share this feature. Four were examined in this study. Three are Subpiak and one is Tlingit. The fifth and sixth hats with this feature, these I have not examined in person, are at the British Museum. One of these British Museum's hats is ostensibly from Cook's third voyage. According to Jonathan King, quote, the interior is sprinkled with red paint, unquote. Although the effect is likely not so striking as these photographs, it is a deliberate application of red paint none, nonetheless. The sixth hat is also at the British Museum. Its interior has both dashes and random and varied splotches of paint, and this is it. Again, I did not see this feature on any hat dated after the 18th century. What could these red marks mean? As a marking on the underside of the hat, they were undoubtedly not for public show. Therefore, are they solely for the wearer of the hat? Because of their simplicity and lack of precision, the marks need not have been applied by an artist. Could they be related to the power and prestige residing in the owner? Could the marks have been made ceremonially? I would be happy to talk with some Tlingit elders about this feature. Dolores says long ago man's hat has the red on the inside. So very exciting. If it's there, yeah, very great. Mo two more hats are significant in this discussion. Both are cook hats from Florence and they have red spots on their exteriors. And here you can see some oxidation, but it's clearly red pigment. You see the red here and it's kind of oxidized and that's just splotches. And then this one's more deliberate. Both hats with exterior red marks are Tlingit hats. Considering the four features revealed to be unique to this time period, this information can be consulted when a hat is believed to be of the 18th century. If any one of these features is present, it, I feel it greatly increases the likelihood that the hat is from the 18th century, that it is that old. So, to conclude, there is a dizzying number of areas of inquiry that we don't have time for today. And I want to mention just a few. Hats, these uh, surface find hats found in rivers and other areas and the techniques they have in common with these 18th century hats. A Haida woman I call the weaver of the hidden turn because she is so detailed in her weaving and she hides where she ends one section of the hat and begins another. Her attention to detail is amazing. And she obviously worked with a wonderful painter. There are myths reflected, not only in the pattern on the hats, but it describing their ephemeral nature and the processes of patience and pattern carried out by the slug and the spider and the weaver and the parallels there. Clan crests as icons and symbols evident in hats, markers of the influence, wealth, power, and prestige of its owner. A vast amount of knowledge and rich meanings are encoded in the physical form of every clan hat. Recognition of the cooperation and partnership when assessing the gendered nature of hat production. And again, Hans mentioned this. Uh, and uh, here you see a weaver marking uh, this is the back of the hat where the weaving comes together and he, she's telling uh, the painter to put the tails of the killer whale at the back of the hat. So it's clear uh, partnership between men and women on this. It's uh, fun to see in, in certain hats. There are Hiltzuk and Kwakwakwak weaving uh, present in collections that I want to look more at. And then there's a confounding absence of hats in collections identified as Tsimshian. And then there's the topic of the hat as tourist item. 
And there are other levels of sensual receptivity besides the visual in the materials gathering, weaving, painting, and wearing of hats, and how weavers connect proximity, spirituality, and sensuality with environmental activism and the shrinking availability of safe places on the land from which to harvest materials. And I look forward to Dolores talking on that. The hat as pure form and as an inspiration for other media. And finally, the parameters for innovation today in a nostalgic marketplace. It is my hope that this research is a way to give meaningful knowledge and analysis back to the communities of weavers who made and continue to make these lovely works of art. Again, as I continue to examine these hats, I look forward to an ever-expanding dialogue with today's weavers and elders. Thank you. I asked the um, carvers if they would go to the Tongass land management meetings because I thought it was really important that those trees that could be made into totem poles and canoes could be saved because there aren't many of them left, those forests of 500 to 1,000 years old. And I was really shocked. I asked them for letters. This is what I have, blank paper. They did not submit anything. And this is really sad because I think this is our last chance. When those 500 to 1,000 year old trees are gone, the art of making totem, bowl, to making totem poles and canoes will also be gone. And I don't think a lot of the carvers realize how urgent it is today because this is the last chance they have to speak on this issue. But one of the things that the weavers have, and I'll, I'll get off this because I get too cranky when I think about the canoes and totem poles, but one of the things that the, um, we have the, almost the same problem when we come to the weavers it's getting harder and harder to get material for our weaving. I really don't look forward to that day when we are going to have to use raffia to do our basketry. We really want to keep using our natural red and yellow cedar bark and spruce root. And right now, the only two places that local people, southeastern people have, are either the airport at Juneau or the Boy Scout camp. Those are the only two places that those of us are, that are weavers can go for those routes. And what is really sad is, you know, some of these native corporations have this land that, they, that they're able to manage. We're not included in that management plan. None of them ever think of, t of setting aside a place where we could get spruce roots. There is one exception, and I'd really like Lonnie to come up and talk about our experience of gathering spruce roots in the Cleckline Canes area. You want to come up, Lonnie? It's kind of hard to find uh, proper roots in our area, too, because most of the area has been logged off, so it's mostly just second growth timber in our immediate area of the village there in Klukwan. However, um, our corporation has a subsidiary company called Chilkat Cruises and Tours and they have these boats that um, they take tourists out on, you know, some, something like what they've got here. And they take um, the weavers out at no cost to Glacier Point to gather spruce roots there. And the roots are uh, a lot better quality because of the 
um, environment there. And uh, I never actually went with you, Dolores, out to Glacier Point, but I know, and I tried arranging um, a group to go out one year, and we were all waiting on the boat harbor dock, and the boat got turned around because the winds were too heavy at that time. So I never actually went out there with you. But um, our corporation also helps helps the weavers by providing scholarships for the weavers to take classes. So that's one way our, our corporation helps. I also would like both Harlena and Darlene to come up and speak about their experiences of harvesting and how long they think they'll be able to harvest in the area that they're uh, doing their basketry, both the red or the yellow cedar bark and the spruce root. Good cheese, Shanti. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you, Dolores, for all your time and, and effort and love for coming to Huna. All the ladies, all the people in our community really appreciate you coming. And uh, thanks to C. Alaska Heritage Foundation for funding the wonderful uh, teacher certificate. And Dawn, you came, and, and it was just wonderful. And we've had, I won't get into that, but uh, just want to say thank you. Um, as far as uh, gathering materials, there are many logging projects that come up. There already has been many years of it, and any of you that have been to Huna see all the trees cut down all over. That We've got miles and miles of logging roads, and, um, and then there's also closures that come. Um, first when they came to say, oh, well, you can, the people will always be able to go on the roads, you know, the, and you'll be able to reach areas you're not able to reach, you know, because of the logging roads, it will keep it open to you. But then they have meeting after meeting about closing the areas, you know, so we're getting even more limited on where we can go. And um, the other thing for, like with spruce roots, Uncle Adam told us where to go uh, several places, but with his memory of his grandmother and other relatives going, you're talking 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago to where the trees were much younger, you know, as in we love the, the smaller roots, you know, with the finer projects. I mean, and so th it's harder to come by, you know, it really is. And with the Ayatug, um timber sale, one good thing about a, there's actually a good timber sale that's happening in Huna, and they're limiting them to supply the two local sawmills. It puts people to work in two, you know, two separate uh, sawmills. It's not a big, big, big sawmill. They're, they're pretty small. And uh, they agreed to k just keep enough timber for those, t to keep the sawmills open, which is good. It's a lot better than what's been going on with the whoomp, you know. So uh, it's, it's getting harder, very hard. And thanks to Dolores coming to Huna, there's more weavers, and so you have more gatherers, and <laughs> and there's also many people that come from out of town to come to Huna because they hear of all our resources, and it's it's just getting more limited. Not not, of, not enough can be said about that. Um, here's something that's being really revitalized in Huna, and. Um, our last venture for spruce roots. <laughs> Several of us ladies uh, had to go in an open boat and about froze just getting to the roots. <laughs> Dedication, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it was very cold, but it was good. So um, I'll let my auntie share more. There's much more to say, but um, it is getting harder. I let her talk first, so I don't have very much to say. <laughs> My Tlingit name is Anya Kohargu, which means back to my homeland. I'm a Kushta Shawu. I belong to the Kushta tribe. My house is the Looking Out House. Um, I, I look at our native culture and what is happening 
and I see an ongoing history of the burning out, which is a story that comes with the Kushta people. The burning out of a heritage and a people struggling to hang on to the very roots of the trees so that they can continue their art form. I'd really like to thank Dolores, who revitalized uh, teaching that my mother had given to me when I was seven years old. I made my first basket and, um, and had forgotten how to weave as I grew up in the white man's culture. And then, then Dolores started coming to Huna and she revitalized that. And I, I am so gratefully thankful to a world of wisdom that she has to offer the native people. Um, we are internally grateful for such a gift. Um, as we go throughout the, the Tlingit Nation, uh, whether it's trees being cut down or places being closed because of road projects and different, different things, it is the basket weavers struggle to keep these things alive. One of the hardest things that the Southeastern women have problems getting is the red cedar because the red cedar isn't isn't down in southeast Alaska it's further south and so that's our dilemma when it comes to the basket weaving but um, we we do everything that we possibly can to get them whether it's going through Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation or Sea Alaska Corporation um, it's an onward fight and we we love doing it um, I'm the least of the experts when it comes to basket weaving. Uh, my expertise is the singing. I, I've been doing it ever since I was a little girl. So um, basket weaving and um, teaching. The last student I was starting to teach was my granddaughter who had passed on. And, um, and just kind of just laid it down for a season and got encouraged by my niece to keep on doing it. And, so we, we're always together because we're always doing things together. But I'd really, um, I really do appreciate basket weaving. Gonna cheesh. I have one more person, but I don't see her. I think she must have. Debbie Head, is she here? Oh yeah, okay. She's gonna talk about harvesting on Prince of Wales Island. Gathering on Prince of Wales Island right now is, is not a problem that I, that I can, um, it, it's not a problem to, to us. Um, I got a call from Harlena, where did Harlena go? Harlena um, this spring. And I felt really bad because um, I know what it's like to want to weave and to weave and not be able to weave the reason I couldn't weave wasn't because of bark, it was because we don't have teachers in our area and, and um, or universities and, and different people. Dolores has come over to Craig and, and is, is from the Heidelberg area and, and, and has helped us over the years, but we're not lucky to have her to live in our community. Um, so I really felt bad for Harlena. You know, I, I, I know that um, when she was asking for red cedar bark and a lot of the other women in Huna, um, and I thought, my goodness, I need to help these people. You know, I, I hope I don't get in trouble locally, um, and, and, and I do gather bark respectfully. I, I learned from uh, Dolores, and, and um, but I, I really get worried because like a lot of other communities in, in Southeast, not only our bark, our, 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 our natural resources are running out, our deer, you know, um, it's hard to find deer anymore. And, and, and so there, there aren't regulations on Prince of Wales saying outside people can't come in. You know, these are our native people. All of Southeast is our native people. And we all like our, our, our subsistence foods. 
um, and, and now we don't have any deer. And, and I'm worried about that with, with our bark is, is you know, as, as logging continues, you know, to, to um, throughout southeast, I'm, I'm worried that, that there is going to be a day pretty soon that it's going to be hard to get bark. And I don't want to uh, weave with raffia either. Um, um, I'm, I'm apprehensive to start with spruce root. I uh, went on Dolores's last trip to Haida Gwaii um, teaching. Um, and and um, I wasn't sure how I felt when I left because I know that's we went on her family's private property and that's okay. But um, when I left, I I kind of felt like I was taking something very valuable from those people on on Queen Charlotte Islands. And, and so I know I know what it feels like when when you run out and, and I'm worried you know there, there was a lady in here yesterday um, uh, selling moccasins and um, my son and I took a, a trip north a couple of years back and um, um, we, we talked with some old people at, at the um, it's like for service I, it's not called for service but the Canadian for service and she says well if you really want authentic things, she says, the first thing you do is you go smell the, the moose hide. And so I was in here yesterday um, peddling some of my baskets, but also looking at some of the other, you know, things that the artists had to offer. And so here I am picking up the moccasins and smelling them. And, and the little girl was looking at me like, I wonder if she's smelling them to see if they've been used before. But <laughs> I said, no, no, no. I says, I'm smelling them to see if they've been smoked tan the old way. And, and um, finally found a table over here where that was the case. And somebody said to me, she was, she was older, and I didn't know which one she was because everyone at the table was talking. And, um, but somebody had said to me, she gathered, or, or she tanned all those hides a long time ago when she was young. So she wouldn't have to do that work um, when she was older, when it was going to be too hard. And, and that's what I don't want is, you know, I don't want to get, I don't have the room for one thing. You know, I've already filled my son's bedroom with bark. Um, it, it, but, because um, there's, it's like running out of fish. It's the worst feeling in the world when you run out of bark and you can't weave. Um, so, so anyway, there, I think it's time to go. But um, I, I, I just don't want that day to come when, when we, you know, we're going to be rationing coils of bark, um, and I, I don't know the solution. Um, I, I do like to help people when I can. Um, uh, right now, Prince of Wales isn't, I don't feel in, in, in big trouble, um, but, you know, we're still logging, so it could be. Um, thank you. I want to read something from, it's called The Local Scene. I'm going back to the Carvers. This is Nathan, a picture of Nathan Jackson. And here is what it says. I'm not going to read the whole article. <laughs> <laughs> Jackson was commissioned by the museum, Field Museum in Chicago to create the, a poll for their permanent collection. Nathan said the museum started talking to them about the pole two years before, but they didn't have a log. When the Cape Fox Corporation donated the log, they were able to start. I think that's really sad that a carver has to wait for two years. It, but on the other hand, I'm mad at him too, because he's now out there talking to the land management plan and asking for a place for the, um, you know, to have these old trees kept for their use. And so in, he'll probably come after me, so I better stop. <laughs> <laughs> but in conclusion, I really would like to have Hans read an article that I got out of the Lost Heritage of Alaska. And I think it's appropriate that a thing would read it. Um, 
Uh, this is called Lost Heritage of Alaska, and this is uh, the excerpt that Dolores asked me to read. And it, it's from 1965. It says, at the same time as if recognizing the vacuity of a taped heritage, past Alaskan Native Brotherhood Grand President Cyrus Peck told the membership that the heritage of character, the spark or light that passes from father to uncle to son and nephew is the most prized possession we get from our ancestors, the only true possession which we ever receive, which cannot be taken physically from us. Do you hear the whisper of your father, of your uncles? Their example is close to us. It is in the air. It is in the spirit. It is our birthright and heritage. As the men of this organization, as the men of this organization were vigilant and brave in the battles of the past, he said, let us be brave in meeting the challenges of today. Gnishish.